If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and again open them to Psalm 19, which is where we'll be this morning. But before we start, I just want to say that if there's anybody in here who is struggling with the question of, is God good or is God merciful? Look no further than the fact that He knew that I was going to have to wear a stupid jacket today. <laughs> and He turned the thermostat about tw- down about 20 degrees so that I don't even feel hot and sweaty <laughs> yet. So, there's that. I don't know if you heard or not, but today is Reformation Sunday. And uh, it's during this week that we, we just take some time and we go back and, and we celebrate uh, what God did 500 years ago this year. Uh, through, through men in his church that he used to preserve the great truths of Scripture and the truth of the gospel and to really save it from being lost uh, to human tradition and, and to false teaching. Joel saved me some time. I won't go back and rehearse what we know as the five solas that the reformers prized, that they clung to, that they preached, and that we prize today precious truths of God's Word that today form a basis for our understanding of the Word of God and our relationship with God. As we talk about the Reformation, though, one of the great figures of the Protestant Reformation 500 years ago was a man named William Tyndale. I know that many of you would be familiar with the name William Tyndale, and there are probably a lot of you in here who could tell, tell us a lot more about William Tyndale than even I could. He's a well-known figure of the Reformation. Lived from 1494 to the year 1536. He was an English reformer and a Bible translator, specifically, who devoted his life to producing an English translation of the Scriptures and putting it into the hands of as many English speakers as he could. William Tyndale's translation of the Bible was the first English translation of the entire Bible in history that came directly from the Greek and Hebrew texts. There were scriptures in English up before the time of William Tyndale, but none of them were complete and none of them came directly from the original languages. William Tyndale was the first one to sit down and put years and years and years into study and translation of the text of Scripture in Greek and Hebrew and to put the entire Bible into the hands of English speakers. The popularity and spread of the Tyndale Bible resulted in legislation in Great Britain that called for the death sentence for anyone caught with an unauthorized Bible. You see, at this time, the relationship between the throne of England and the Roman Catholic Church was still as strong as ever. And obviously, the Roman Catholic Church did not like the, tr- the truth of Scripture being translated into the language of the common people. They used only a Latin translation. And so when William Tyndale and others like him are working to put the Bible into English and to get it into the hands of the British people... This is frowned upon by the Roman Catholic Church who exerts their authority, who exerts their influence over the King of England and causes them to pass legislation that says if you're caught with an unauthorized translation of the Bible, you will die. That crime is punishable by death. Because his work, and again the work of other men like him, of Bible translation and distribution amounted to a direct assault on the authority of of the Roman Catholic Church, which was adamant about keeping the Scriptures out of the hands of the common man. He was a threat to their power, because if you can read the Scriptures yourself, you can interpret them for yourself, and you don't need a priest or a pope to tell you what the Scriptures say. King Henry VIII of England was furious with William Tyndale. And he sought to arrest him for believing and promoting the Reformation teachings of Martin Luther 
whose influence Tyndale had come under, and the other reformers as they were taught in the Scriptures. And so to preserve his own life, William Tyndale fled England and was living in exile on the European continent in hiding, continuing to work on his translation of the Bible. King Henry dispatched a man named Stephen Vaughan with his authority, and the job of Stephen Vaughan was to go find William Tyndale and bring him back to England. With him, as he came to the European continent, Vaughan carried an offer of, quote, midi, midi, pity, mercy, and compassion from the king if William Tyndale would give up his work and return to England. Tyndale responded that he would give himself up to the king on one condition, that the king authorize a complete Bible translation from the Greek and Hebrew in the common language of the people, because to this point, like we said, one did not exist. Here was his quote, directly from the lips of William Tyndale himself to Stephen Vaughan. He said, I assure you, if it would stand with the king's most gracious pleasure to grant only a bare text of the scripture to be put forth among his people, like it is put forth among the subjects of the emperor in these parts, and of other Christian princes, be it of the translation of whatever person soever shall please his majesty, I shall immediately make faithful promise never to write more, nor abide two days in these parts after the same, but immediately to return unto his realm and there most humbly submit myself at the feet of his royal majesty, offering my body to suffer what pain or torture, yea, what death his grace will. So this be obtained. Until that time, I will abide the asperity of all chance, whatsoever shall come, and endure my life in as many pains as it is able to bear and suffer. I'll come back if the king will authorize a translation of the Bible in English. And so in a letter to one of the king's advisors in June of 1531, Stephen Vaughn wrote about Tyndale, and his quote was that I find him always singing one note. And that note was, would the king of England grant his authorization to a translation of the Bible in the English language? What was it that drove William Tyndale and others like him to sing this one note his entire life? It was an unshakable conviction that the scriptures teach us that mankind is in bondage to sin, that we're dead, that we are helpless, and that God has acted through His only Son, Jesus Christ, to provide salvation by grace through faith alone. And that these truths, these most important truths that any one of us will ever hear, are revealed only through the majesty of the written Word of God. And so today, as we have talked and rehearsed in our thinking and in our singing, five solas, I want to focus this morning on the very first one. Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone, the only rule of faith and practice for the church of Jesus Christ. Not that the other ones are not important, obviously, uh, or that we can't even say that one is more important than the others, but in a certain sense, the principle of Scripture alone is the critical principle on which all the other ones come from. See, our, our knowledge of faith, of grace, of Jesus Christ and God Himself would be incomplete apart from God's self-revelation in Scripture. It's through the Scriptures, through the written Word, that we learn of the necessity of faith, the source of grace, the person and work of Christ, and the glory of God in the Gospel. And so for William Tyndale and those who worked with him, Bible translation and Bible truth were inseparable. And it was this conviction 
that drove him to translate the scriptures and so ignite the Reformation in England by translating these scriptures into English and by doing so, in effect, sign his own death warrant. My question for us today, as we hear about men like William Tyndale, and we hear the, the, the principle of Scripture alone rehearsed for us, do we as Christians today, do we as God's people, do we as the church of Jesus today, see and understand and prize the majesty of the written Word of God as highly as a man like William Tyndale and men like him? What's our attitude towards the Word of God? Are we flippant? Is this something that, yeah, okay, it comes with me on Sundays? Hey, I open it up. I know it. I know it's good. Yeah, I sort of kind of try to live by it. It's great. Or do we really see it for what it is? God himself revealed in human language for the good and nourishment of our souls, for the glory of his son Jesus, and for the building up of his church. And so when I was thinking about these things this week, I, I thought of a very well-known passage in Psalm 19 that we're going to look at this morning. A passage, or a poem, that was written by King David that is all about God's self-revelation that serves as an antidote to complacency when it comes to the Word of God. See, Psalm 19 is a hymn, like we said, that David wrote, it's all about the majesty of God's self-revelation. We don't have the time to look at all of it this morning. But the first six verses actually deal with God's revelation of Himself in creation. Through what He has made. God shows His glory, His existence, His greatness, His majesty, His, His, His great power through what He has made. We see that in verses 1-6 through 6 of Psalm 19. And then we come to verse 7, and it changes the focus of the hymn changes from God's focus, I'm sorry, from God's revelation of himself through creation to God's revelation of himself through written human language. We call that the scriptures. C.S. Lewis, in talking about this psalm, referred to it as the greatest poem in the Psalter and one of the greatest lyrics in the world. The Anglican pastor John Stott said, from the Christian point of view, it contains the clearest summary of the doctrine of revelation to be found in the Old Testament. And so today, as we look at Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11, what we're going to look at are six characteristics of the Word of God that are meant to point us to its majesty and encourage us to value and obey it as we ought for the purpose of knowing and loving our Creator more. Now, each one of these could be a topic for a sermon for an entire week if we wanted to. But I got one shot, unless somebody's come up with a plan to keep Steve in Israel for longer. Okay, so I got this week. So we're going to take the bird's eye view of this passage today. And I encourage you, maybe it'll serve as a platform for your own study or for your own thinking throughout the week. These descriptions, these six characteristics that we see of the written word of God are not meant to be studied individually. Okay? They're meant to together provide us with a clearer picture of everything that God has given us in His Word and to help us to appreciate it more. Okay? They're not intended to form a comprehensive doctrine of everything that the Word of God is and everything that it does, but only a snapshot this morning that causes us to step back when we're done with it and go, wow, wow. The Word of God is amazing. And the God that the Word is about is amazing. If we can walk out of here with that this morning, I'll be a happy man. So let's go ahead and read our passage again. It's very short. Psalm 19, verses 7-11. through 11. It says, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of
nevertheless, for lack of a better term, the generic Semitic word for God. It can be the God of Scriptures, capital G. It could be a different God, a false God, lowercase g. It simply means something along the lines of the mighty one. It's a generic term, more or less, for God. It is the God of creation, which is appropriate since it fits the subject matter. But that's verses 1 through 6. In verse 7, starting with verse 7, and throughout the rest of the psalm, the word El is not used again. What is used then in reference to God is the personal name of God. The name Yahweh or Jehovah. This starts in verse 6 and carries through the rest of the psalm. And the change in reference to God really right away teaches us much about God's revelation. You see, we can know God's existence. We can know His glory. We can know His greatness through creation. We can walk outside and look up at the sky and know these things. But we can never come to know God on a personal, relational level only through creation, to know God in a special way, to know Him in a personal way requires special revelation on His part. And He has revealed Himself through written words in Scripture. The revelation of the Word of God in Scripture is clearer and more specific than the revelation in nature that we have of God. And without it, without God's special revelation, our knowledge of God, of salvation, of everything that He's done through us in His Son, Jesus Christ, is woefully incomplete. And so as we come to Psalm 19, verse 7 today, we see that the law of the Lord, first of all, is perfect. Law here is the term that's used for God's written word for the Scriptures. It's the comprehensive term for God's revealed will. It says the law of the Lord is perfect. As it's perfect, it reveals God's perfect will to us. Like, for example, we see in the New Testament, Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, where Paul writes, says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might know, or by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. God's will towards us in Scripture is perfect and complete. He's hidden nothing that He desires for His people to do. As His perfect revelation, it is absolutely well-meaning towards us as His people, and it's directed towards our total well-being. And in this characteristic of, in this case, the law of God in its perfection, in its totality, in its completeness, God has the interest of His people at heart. Because you see there, in verse 7, He says, it revives the soul. In reviving our souls, it first of all imparts new life. As we look in its pages and we read of the holy, only begotten Son of God, Jesus Christ, who came to earth to die for sinners so that we can have forgiveness of sins, so that we could obtain the salvation of our souls. And we believe those truths. They revive us. They impart new life. And the one who heeds the Word of God finds eternal life and salvation, which is our deepest need as human beings. It assures forgiveness and cleansing to the repentant sinner. What more do we need as we sit here this morning? We see not only, first of all, that the Word of God is perfect, but we see secondly in verse 7, second part of verse 7, he says, the testimony of the Lord is sure. It makes wise the simple. And so our second characteristic this morning of the Word of God, not only is it perfect, but it is sure. In the latter part of verse 7, the Scriptures are referred to as the testimony of the Lord. This points to the fact that the Word of God, the Scriptures that you hold in your hand this morning, are truth that is attested to by God Himself. 
He is the source of truth. He is the divine author of Scripture. You see, what we see in the pages of Scripture, it's not simply when it comes to truth that God is more truthful than you or I. That, you know, we're on, you know, there's, a, there's some sort of a cosmic scale of truth, and God is on one side, and we're on the other, and God weighs out heavier, and the scale goes down in His direction. No, that's not what Scripture teaches about God. What the Bible tells us is that God Himself is the scale. God Himself and His words are the standard by which everything else is judged when it comes to truth. And this is what this characteristic of the Word of God focuses on this morning. His testimony. It is God's testimony about Himself, about what is true, about what is right, and about what is wrong. The Scriptures are the beacon of truth. And they set forth God's gracious relationship with His people throughout history. In it we see this is who God is, this is who we are, and this is how we relate to each other. It's a covenant declaration. And so we see in God's self-testimony about Himself, it says this testimony of God, of the Lord, is sure. Not meaning, hey, surely it's true, but sure in the sense of this is what is right and this is what is confirmed. This is truth against which everything else that makes a truth claim must be judged. God's Word provides sure footing on which we can build our lives. As I was thinking about this characteristic this week, I thought of Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 24. We're not going to take the time to read it this morning or to go there. I encourage you to write it down and go back and look at it again this week, where Jesus compares the two men that are building houses, right? And he says, one builds his house on sand. He builds his house. It's a foundation of sand, and when the winds come... And the waves beat on it, it collapses because it has no sure footing. Well, what is the sand? The sand is the truths, the traditions of men. And then Jesus compares that with his words. He says, the one who built his house on a rock is like the one who builds his life on my words and on my truth. And this man built his house on the rock and the winds came and the waves came and the house stood firm because it had a good foundation. And Jesus says, so it is with you in life. The one who builds his life, who trusts my word, and who builds his life on the foundation of my word, and reads it, and listens to it, and heeds it, has a sure foundation to weather the storms of life when they come. And he will not fall. Not because he's strong, but because my words are sure. Because the testimony of the Lord is sure. God's words makes promises, absolute promises that can be trusted. Likewise, it makes threats that will come to pass if we do not heed it. And the scriptures say, if the testimony of the Lord is sure, then it makes wise the simple. Simple is a term used in the wisdom literature, not in a name-calling sense, but in a descriptive sense. The simple one is a term for one who is open-minded, who is naive, who is easily led astray. He's not to the point of the fool yet. The fool is the one who has said in his heart, there is no God. The simple is one who just lacks understanding. He's one that that is open-minded. He's one that's open to a lot of ideas. And he takes a lot of stuff in and he doesn't have the discernment to sort through what is right and what is wrong, what is true and what is false. He just kind of takes everything in. He needs to be educated. And what the scriptures tell us is that for the one who is simple, the word of God can be trusted to make him wise. When the one who needs to be educated, when the one who needs to be learned, when the one who is probably a little bit too open-minded comes to the Word of God and reads it and accepts it for what it is and says, this is truth, I will build my life on this, he is made wise. He is made skillful in living. He is now equipped to live a life that is pleasing and honoring to God. 
His life is now built on sure footing and he has the stability that is needed to navigate the inevitable trials that are going to come his way in this life. So not only is the law of God perfect, is the word of God sure, making wise the simple, but thirdly, we see in verse 8, the first part, the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The third characteristic that we see in Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11, is that the word of God is right. It's right. Here, the term that is used is precepts, depending on what translation you're reading from this morning. It points, this term, however it's translated in your Bible, points to the precision of the Word of God. God knows exactly what we need when we need it. Think of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, that says, The Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it talks about how it pierces through us as human beings. Hey, even to the innermost part of our heart, and it discerns who we are and what we are before God. This is the precision of the Word of God that David writes about in Psalm 19. God knows exactly what His people need when they need it, and He uses His written Word to administer that. It says the precepts of the Word of God are right, Right here refers to what is morally right. It shows us what we should do ethically. It shows us the difference between right and wrong. It is the standard, again, of right and wrong. Again, this is not a case of God simply being more right than us. You know, here we are on the scale of goodness, and then here's God, and He ranks above us. No, God is the standard of right and wrong. And as Scripture reveals God Himself to us, it reveals what is that absolute standard of right and wrong. There's no debating. It's not open to discussion. It's this is right and this is wrong, and you're better off if you live by what is right, by what is revealed in the Word of God. It says the piercing precepts of the Lord are right, they distinguish right and wrong, and this rejoices the heart. Well, for many of us, we don't associate it being told what is right and what is wrong with rejoicing oftentimes. I understand that. How does it rejoice the heart? Well, it makes our hearts rejoice because a life lived according to the Word of God leads to a joyful conscience that's free from guilt. What greater joy is there to know God through Jesus Christ and to live according to His Word, never perfectly on this earth, but to live a life that's based on the precepts of His Word that seeks to obey it as far as what is right and wrong and the free and easy conscience that comes from that. Free before God, free before our fellow man. The inner peace and tranquility that a life lived by the Word of God brings is priceless, as we will see here in, in just a few verses. And so the Word of God is perfect. It revives the soul. It is sure. It's able to make even the simple wise. Thirdly, it is right. And in being right, it causes our heart to rejoice. And the fourth characteristic we see in verse 8 that the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The word that David chooses here to reflect or to describe the Word of God is the word commandment. This points and is a reference to the authority of God that backs up the Scriptures. You see, I don't stand here this morning just holding up a book before you like any other book, and saying, hey, you know, it's really old, so you should obey it. Do that. Let's go try to live our lives by this, because it seems to be the best possible way. No. It's right, and it is good, and it is deserving of our reverence and our obedience, because it comes from God Himself. 
It is like no other book that has ever been written or will be written in human history. These are the words of the living God, the creator of heaven and earth. The one to whom we owe our existence and the one to whom we will all answer to one day, sooner or later. And so when David writes of the commands of Scripture, the commands of the Lord, he's pointing back to God and saying, this is the one with whom you have to do. It is authoritative. And the authoritative characteristic of the Word of God reminds us that like we see in the second part of verse 8, it is pure. This is a word that as David wrote it, I think he was probably thinking of the refining of metals in that culture. Gold or silver or other precious metal that has been melted down in the fire, that has been put to the test, that the dross has been scraped off, and now what you have is something that is solid and pure, that has been tested and refined. Oftentimes this allusion is used in Scripture to God's words. We see it, for example, if we just jump back to the 12th Psalm, Psalm 12, verse 6, it says, The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. This is the Word of God. Not that there was ever any impurity in it that needed to be refined. That's not the picture. The picture is that it's been tested. God has put it forth to us, and men have lived by it. They have tested it, in effect, and found it to be never, ever failing. It's pure, it's clear. It is understandable. Scripture stands, as we say, sola scriptura, Scripture alone. Scripture stands alone as the test for faith and practice for the people of God, and it will never let us down because it is the pure, tested, and refined words of God. The commandment of the Lord is pure, it enlightens the eyes. Light is a picture used throughout the Old Testament, throughout all of Scripture. It's a picture of, of being able to live a life that's free from uncertainty. It's the ability to make sound decisions and judgments. The one who walks in light is the one who walks and who lives a pure life. He lives a sound life. This person lives a life where they're making sound judgments that please and honor God. How else would we know how to please God if He didn't tell us in His Word? Light also refers to our, our whole condition. Not just in the way that we live, but in the way that we think, in the way that we act, in our mental and spiritual state. It is enlightened. We no longer walk in darkness, but rather as children of light, as we have come to know God and trust Him through His written Word and His Son Jesus Christ as He is revealed in the Word, so we have life for our body, for our thinking, for our understanding. Just as God has given the sun for light in creation so that we can be illuminated, so we don't walk around stumbling all day long in darkness, so He has given His Word for light in salvation to lead us to truth so that we can clearly see. And so the refined Word of God is pure. It's been tested. It has been proven to be never failing. And so we live by it and thus we are enlightened. It gives us light. It shows us how to live. It clearly directs us. And so God's Word his written testimony of himself in Scripture is perfect. It is sure. It is right. It is pure. And fifthly, we see in verse 9 that the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Now this term fear, used for the Word of God, is not necessarily a term directly for God's Word, but rather David here uses the term that points to our response 
to God's word. Fear is our proper response to the word of God. It's what God's word demands, effects, and maintains within the one who reads it and listens to it. See, the Bible has much to say about the fear of God. Think, for example, and you can turn with me or look on the screen to Proverbs 8, a well-known passage. Well-known verse, Proverbs 8, verse 13, it says, The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. Psalm 119, verse 9. It says, How can a young man keep his way pure by guarding it according to your word? And so it's with these, it's with these thoughts that David writes that the fear of the Lord is clean. You see, when we read the word of God and understand it for what it is, that it's God's self-testimony about himself meant to be obeyed because it carries the authority of the creator of the universe behind it, our only response is to fear. Or our right response should be to fear. Our proper response is fear. In the sense of we recognize it for what it is, we recognize ourselves for what we are, and we say, this written word has authority over me. And so as we've seen in Proverbs chapter 8, 13, where it says the fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. In Psalm 119, verse 9, where it says, how can a young man keep his way clean or pure? By keeping it according to your word, by living according to your commandments. We see that the fear of God, as we see him and read about him and come to know him through the scriptures, keeps us pure. It keeps us free from the stain of sin when we read the Word of God and we say, I will obey that. And when God tells us, don't do this, don't do that, do this, do that, it enables us to live a life that is clean and free from the destructive power of sin. And so God's commands are not meant to keep us from happiness, to keep us from doing the things that we want to do, but rather to keep us from destructive behavior, ultimately destructive because it's, offense, it's offensive to a holy God and we will be judged for that behavior unless we find salvation in Jesus Christ. It's also behavior that destroys our quality of life here on earth in the meantime, before we stand before God. And so it says, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. There's one more characteristic this morning of the Word of God that we're going to look at. We see it in verse 9. See, through verses 7 through 11, the law of the Lord is perfect. It's sure. It's right. It is pure. It is clean. And lastly, we see in the second part of verse 9 that the rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. The word rules here could also be translated as judgments. Because what this characteristic that David singles out here is pointing to are the judgments that God, the righteous judge of the universe, has made about our human situation and human, human condition. He writes that the rules or the judgments that the judge of the universe has set forth in his word are true. And again, this is a word that's used to describe not just the truthfulness of the statements found in the Word of God, but the truthfulness or the dependability of the Word of God. It's trustworthiness. Here David sets up a contrast between the Word of God and the wearisome compromise, insincerity, and half-truth that so often characterizes our sin-stained human relationships. Especially if you're like me in our society today, feels like there's a constant just bombardment of somebody says this and it's not true, and somebody says this, and here's fake news, 
And here's half-truths. And well, this is kind of, sort of true. Or this could be true, depending on your perspective. Doesn't it just wear us out sometimes? Don't our souls just long for something that we can trust no matter what? That when it's here and it's in front of us, that we can just depend on it and say, this is true and I know it and I can bank on it and I can build my life on it. And I know that if I read it and understand it, I'm never going to be led astray. Well, this is the Word of God. This is the book that you have with you this morning that we have been studying. In the midst of of the compromise and the uncertainty and the half-truth and the fake news and all the other garbage that's out there, we have the Word of God that we can trust. God's Word saves us and its trustworthiness saves us from the tedious destructiveness of sin. We can trust the Word because we can trust God. It's not trustworthy because I say it. It's trustworthy absolutely in its entirety because it comes from a God who is the standard of truth. If He says it, if He is it, it is truth. And it's all written about Him. And so the rules of the Lord are thus true and righteous altogether. And again, this word righteous is not just a word that points to it's good, or it's more righteous than you and I. But it's been refined. It stands above the smut and the stain of our society. It is untouchable. It will never change. No matter what man says, no matter what sort of iffy morality comes into fashion and passes away and proves its own destructive nature, the Word of God stands above it as a beacon of truth, as a beacon of righteousness. And God says, if you look to this, and you know me through this, and you trust me in this, you'll be just fine on the other side. God's Word is clear, it's open, and it's sufficient for everyone. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. So what we see here in the first Three verses are a passage, verses 7 and 8 and 9. The Word of God is perfect, first of all. It revives our souls. The Word of God is sure. It makes wise even the simple. The Word of God is right. It rejoices our heart. The commandment of the Lord. The Word of God is pure. It enlightens our eyes. The Word of God is clean in that it endures forever. The Word of God is true and righteous. Together, Derek Kidner, in his commentary on the Psalms, he says, Together, these terms show the practical purpose of revelation. Again, not meant to be studied separately, but a picture together. To bring God's will to bear on the hearer and evoke intelligent reverence, well-founded trust, and detailed obedience. So that brings us to the final two verses of our passage this morning. And normally when you're writing a sermon, you come to the conclusion and you say, okay, what am I going to write for my conclusion? What does this mean for us? How do I tie this all together? Well, David did the hard work for me this morning in verses 10 and 11. Talking about the Word of God, more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and in keeping them... There is great reward. We come to the question this morning, what response ought this to evoke in us? What does this mean for us? Two things as we come to the conclusion this morning. First of all, as we see in verse 10, more to be desired are the words of God than gold, even much fine gold. What I would love to see for each one of us in here this morning is an increased desire to know the Word of God because it is infinitely valuable. I know many times, even as God's people, as Christians, we are tempted and we undervalue the Word of God. 
How many of us, myself included, have ever struggled with, I just, I don't feel like reading it today. I don't feel like it. I got other stuff to do. Okay? Or our obedience is lacking. We read it and we go, I, yeah, okay, I see that, but it sounds really hard. Okay? I don't know that I have this, the, just the juice to do that today. We undervalue the Word of God. I hope this morning we are encouraged and refreshed and reminded as we look at these six characteristics of the incredible value of what we have here in our hands this morning. This is not just the words of men. These are the words of God. It is so perfect, the written Word of God, that it can convert, transform, and refresh the entire person. Why is it valuable? Because only Scripture can make us wise or skillful in the issues of daily living. Scripture is valuable because it always directs God's people in the right way, the way that pleases God. It's valuable because its commands that we see and that we read are a light for our lives and direction for our lives. It's valuable because it never, ever needs amending, updating, or editing. It is permanently and forever relevant and eternally true. It's valuable because it enables us to obey God with righteous lives. And so for those times when we are tempted to undervalue it, I encourage us to go back and remind ourselves of what we have here. The written words of God. Hey, but we see also in verse 11 another response. Not only to value the Word of God, but in verse 11, moreover by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. Don't just value it. But if we value it, we ought to keep it. We ought to store it in our hearts to meditate on it for the purpose of obeying God. Reading and obeying the Word of God will keep us from sin. David writes in verse 11, he says, in keeping of your words, there is great reward. Reading and obeying the Word of God brings great spiritual blessing. It brings conviction of sin for both the believer and the non-believer alike. It brings conversion which meets our deepest need of salvation through Jesus Christ. It gives us counsel when we have questions about life. It brings us comfort in the difficult times of life. It enables us to know God, which is the whole point. The point is not, hey, just read this book because it will direct you in life. No, this book is important because it reveals God to us. And without it, we would never ever know Him in a way that would lead us to a relationship with Him, which is what we really need. For the believer, it brings sanctification. In reading it and knowing it and obeying it, we become more and more like Christ. And so I don't profess to stand here today and say anything that I don't think you've ever heard before. I don't think that anyone was ever shocked here this morning by these six characteristics but how much do we really remember them in our day-to-day -day lives? How much do you appreciate what you have in the Word of God? And again, I encourage us to appreciate what we have and read it and obey it and keep it so that you would know God better. Okay? So that you would have eternal life when we read the Scriptures and we see God and we know Him through the pages of His written Word. Appreciate what we have, read it and obey it and keep it. Because in it we find God and in relationship with Him we find eternal life. In the year 1524, William Tyndale fled his homeland of England and lived as a fugitive until his death on the European continent in 1536, living in hiding. During his time in hiding, he watched the rise of persecution at the hands of the Roman Catholic Church 
and saw many of his close friends killed by Roman Catholic officials. They couldn't reach him where he was on the European continent, but they could get to his friends. And many of them suffered the pains of torture and execution because of their commitment to translating and putting the Word of God into the hands of English speakers. After he lived in hiding for 11 years, in the year 1535, William Tyndale was betrayed and handed over to British officials by a man who was supposedly a close friend of his. He was imprisoned for 18 incredibly hard months on charges of heresy against the Roman Catholic Church, who assembled a panel for the sole purpose of proving that he was a heretic and condemning him to death. He was brought to trial in August of 1536, and there officially, before the Roman Catholic Church, he was condemned as a heretic and sentenced to death. So on October 6th, 1536, William Tyndale was tied to a stake, strangled by the executioner, and burned. And I can't read it or think about it without being moved. According to the church historian John Fox, his well-known last words were, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. At his death, he was 42 years old. He was never married, never had a proper burial for the sake of the word of God. Oh, that we, in our day-to-day lives, would prize it like this man and others like him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, not just because, not because it's the words of men, but for how you have revealed yourself to us in its pages. Thank you for making provision for us that we could know it so that we could know you. Father, I thank you for the sacrifice that so many made throughout history to put your word into our hands. It's, it's, it's because of what you did through men like William Tyndale that we sit here today and that we have access to your truth. And so thank you for your greatness and what you did through them. We just pray, Father, that you would help us in our day-to-day lives that you would help us to treasure your word more because we want to love you and know you more and that you would give us grace to obey so that again, Father, we could deepen our walk with you. Father, we just thank you for everyone who's come out today. We ask that you use the truth of your word to bless us as we go. And we pray in your son's Jesus' name. Amen.